Municipal governments are comprised of local elected officials and encompass a range of administrative bodies, including cities, towns, villages, and municipal districts. Join us in the Political Trenches Local Government at Work as we examine the most pressing issues confronting municipal governments throughout Canada. I'm your host, Christopher Brown, and I am joined by my co-host, Ian McCormick, President of Strategic Steps Incorporated. Together, we will provide insight and perspective on the challenges and opportunities that confront local government as they strive to serve their communities. Today's episode is H is for Housing, a fundamental aspect of our lives that often goes unnoticed. Today, we have two special guests with us, Nancy Simmons, the CEO for the Heartland Housing Foundation, and Lauren Ingalls, the CAO for Westwind Communities. But before we get into the interview, we discuss Ian's tour through BC, speaking with municipal leaders, a story about Council Code of Conduct and Canada Day. And we pick up on a story from earlier this year where a councillor in Ontario believes councillor should show up for work. With a jam-packed episode, let's get into this. Ian, how are you? Pretty good. It feels like it's been a while, Chris. I wasn't here for the last episode, so it's nice to be back for this one. Yes, it certainly is. And I'm looking forward to discussing these three great topics, but also this great interview that we have coming up. But Ian, uh, as I said in our introduction, you have been on a swing through British Columbia talking to uh, newly elected uh, local uh, councillors and re-elected local councillors. What are you hearing from them? Yeah, for sure. It's actually about 75% of the people who I've been speaking to have been first term councillors. So that is really kind of fascinating. Uh, we were hired, or I was hired to provide some keynote addresses to a series of four regional sessions for the Local Government Leadership Academy, which is associated with the Union of BC Municipalities, or UBCM. So as we do this, the uh, I've spoken in, in both Richmond and uh, last week I was in Kelowna, and this week I'll be in Kimberley, and next week I'll be in Prince George on the same sort of topic, speaking around the uh, who's driving the greater book. So a little bit around role clarity, a little bit about planning. But something that I've really been interested in hearing is what these folks are talking about. So they obviously put their names on a ballot for a reason, and they then got elected by their populations because uh, the population agreed with them. Though so there are a couple, there well, there are some very specific points that do come up. There are a couple that I'm seeing really emerge. Uh, the first one is around community safety, and so it's a social issue, and certainly of interest to people who choose to live in a particular community for a particular reason. And the social issues are around not only things like policing and bylaw enforcement and that sort of thing, but the kind of cracked window syndrome about how do we fix something before it becomes systemically problematic. And this shows up as things like the RCMP contract about community police officers. So some of it is statistical, how much, how many in terms of uh, crime and public safety. The other is around feelings of public safety. And the two are often linked, but sometimes they're not. But there are those who would play on our fears around public safety to say that a place isn't public, isn't safe and elect me and I'll clean it up. And there are others who say, you know what, we live in a really safe community, let's augment that. So I do see a little bit of inherent tension there. The second most, second significant issue we're seeing at the moment is around climate change and particularly the municipal response to uh, climate change as it happens, or the effects of it, and then the mitigation of climate change looking longer term into the future, so truly the strategic nature of governance. And the, the first part is dealing with things like forest fires, or too much or too little water, of, uh, floods and droughts and that sort of thing, or water in the wrong place, uh, that is becoming more and more prominent or prevalent and how local governments are having to deal with that, whether it's rural or whether it's urban. The second then is kind of what do we do in terms of appending climate change? How do we slow it down? How do we react to it? So some of that is around municipal infrastructure. Some of that is around carbon footprint and that sort of thing. So Chris, those are the two big topics I'm seeing as we, as you've said, to kind of do the magical mystery tour through BC. And it'll be interesting to see if the perspectives, particularly on climate change differ as we move further north into British Columbia as well. And I suspect that these topics would be similar in many places across the country. So it's been really quite interesting to do. Now, you just mentioned two subjects that are traditionally more in the provincial wheelhouse of tackling, whether it be climate change, even federal, or crime and social issues, yet again, being a provincial issue. Um, 
when you speak to these uh, uh, municipal councillors from across BC, are they aware of that? And are they aware that municipal politics now have to pick up the downloaded services that uh, the provincial government may not be addressing in their small rural or urban communities? I think we probably are. The What we're finding, though, first of all, not everybody who exists in a local community understands the difference in the order of government and what their responsibilities are. They just happen to have somebody at their doorstep who is running for office, and so they want something fixed or changed. So that's part of it. The second is uh, because municipalities, local governments of all sorts and types across the country are are identified as under the authority of the various provinces and territories, the, the, the ability of local government to download responsibility for something, either by actually downloading the responsibility or by abdicating the responsibility themselves, is one thing, but typically we see that that responsibility downloaded without the authority or without commensurate resources to deal with it, which further stretches local governments as well. So that has an impact on budgets. We're gonna talk a little later today about housing, for example, and we will see that things like social housing are in a similar boat to those other topics that are getting downloaded from other orders of government and making it more difficult for local governments to deal with truly local issues. You are speaking to most of these new, newly elected municipal councillors in their first hundred days in office. Right. Uh, w- when you're speaking to them, are you asking the question that I always want to know? How has the first hundred days been compared to what you thought it was going to be? So I I don't ask it as part of my keynote address because I'm actually speaking to them, but I do frequently ask that of of councillors or mayors or Reeves or wardens or whatever. And I'd say 85% of the people who I say, when I ask the question, is the job what you thought it was going to be? will say, no, it's not. And usually it's because the job is more than they thought it was going to be. It takes more time, takes more energy. Uh, there is more work to be done, more meetings to be had than I thought there were going to be. Sometimes I also find that people, uh, first timers, don't really understand the lo- role of local government yet. And as you said, they are in their first 100 days. So in some ways, they don't even know what they don't know. And that is something we talk about. So that's pretty universal uh, that I've when I talk to elected officials kind of across the country, that that the role that they occupy isn't exactly what they thought it was going to be. According to a CBC article, members of Cape Britain's regional council have ruled their mayor breached the municipality's code of conduct for elected officials during heated discussions over Canada Day celebrations in 2022. The breach of the Code of Conduct, according to the news article, stems from some councillors saying that they were unfairly called racists in an email exchange after questioning the decision to call July 1st events Night of Lights amid calls from Indigenous groups from across the country to reconsider Canada Day and the legacy of residential schools. One councillor obtained a document through a Freedom of Information request that appears to show an email exchange between the mayor and several people the mayor describes as advisors. Now, Ian, this brings up some questions that I wanted to discuss, and that's why I chose this story. Do mayors have the right to talk to, quote unquote, advisors about things that are going on in council? For sure. they Well, within reason, they do, Chris. The, the concept of like a kitchen cabinet, which might just be members of the local community, might be business people, organizations, or even neighbors, for example, helps to get a bit of a flavor that maybe just the individual occupying the office, the mayor in this case, may not have. So that is fairly typical. Uh, it is, however, constrained by freedom of information and protection of privacy legislation, and typically municipal acts as well. So that uh, discussion that is, say, to be kept confidential in camera or through a closed session uh, can't be discussed outside that closed session or outside the group of individual council members until it is discussed or released publicly. And so the kitchen cabinet can be used to run ideas by or to talk after the fact about how a decision might be implemented. But But the kitchen cabinet, group of advisors, whatever you want to call it, can't be used to discuss information that is not yet in the public realm. And so that might be part of this. The the topic though of changing the name of Canada Day or looking at the calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or in this case, the legacy of residential schools, while very important, still is covered by those, uh, those restrictions around keeping confidential information confidential 
until it has been released publicly or discussed publicly by counsel. So in this, that might be some of the nuance for this case. Good idea, maybe not appropriately used without having spoken to any of the, the people in involved in this case. No, and, and we should preface that as well by saying that we're only getting from what the CBC article has put out and from what it has stated. This all stems from the director of community services uh, making uh, doing an interview about the name change and sort of the public backlash that uh, coincided with the name change. It brings up a question that I have, though, because this is this was the crux of what I try to figure out when I read articles like this. Sure. Who is considered part of that internal core? So if the mayor had just spoke to the CAO or the CEO, CEO or the city manager, would that be a code of conduct breach? Is it when the mayor then talks to somebody outside of the organization who was not in a closed door session an in-camera meeting we call it here uh is is that the moment it then breaks that code of conduct because i i know sometimes that uh municipalities bring other people into those in-camera sessions whether it be lawyers whether it be uh directors whether it be the cao who who, who can you talk to and not talk to when it's an in-camera session uh, so uh, without looking at so too much nuance, council gets to decide who gets involved and who doesn't. Ultimately, all the decisions are council's decisions. If it's in closed session, the default is the council is present. Council then can invite who they want. They would typically invite their chief administrative officer. You mentioned a lawyer. They may invite that uh, person. If it's around a specific subject matter, they may bring in a director, manager, engineer, something like that for those subject matters. But they would be municipal people uh, unless there's a rationale to bring in external people. When I speak to councils, I often say that they are each other's first team, that they know more about their community than anybody else does. And that would include their families, their spouses, anything like that, the people they work with, for precisely the reason that local government business needs to stay, some of it needs to stay confidential in accordance with provincial legislation around protection of privacy. And that differs slightly province by province and territory by territory too. So really the decision is councils. They would take advice from the people that they hire uh, to, and the, the minimum number would be council. And sometimes a, a, an individual member of council may even be excluded from some of those conversations if they find themselves in a, in a conflict of interest or sometimes a pecuniary interest, which really just means a conflict of interest that deals with money. So it starts with council and can expand out from there uh, based on, on what council decides. The final story before our interview is from back in January of this year. A councillor from Sudbury, Ontario, wants his fellow councillors to do their job by showing up and doing just that. In the Sudbury Star story, Councillor LaPierre, is quoted to have said, our residents elected us to be their representatives and make the best decisions possible with funds from the property taxes they pay. Being at meetings, being part of the conversation and decision-making process is part of our responsibilities. In a motion, the councillor put forward, he wants administration to put together a quarterly table report that will provide a quick view for the councillor's evaluation as well as public to see the elected official's participation level. Ian, this is a unique story in itself because it's basically calling out councillors without calling out councillors, is it not? Yeah, it's probably something that happens fairly regularly in quite a few municipalities across really? the country. The idea of, well, the, that so one councillor may be upset about other councillors for one reason or another, yeah. The idea of an attendance list, though, kind of rubs me a little bit the wrong way because it seems to be almost like a gotcha performance. This councillor, however, seems genuinely uh, frustrated that other members of council either aren't showing up to the debate or aren't showing up to the vote or both. And in some municipal, and sorry, in some provinces and territories, of course, you actually have to vote on a topic unless there's a reason you can't. In other municipal, sorry, other uh, uh, provinces and territories, it's a little bit different than that. But the idea of actually keeping track of who showed up when, I mean, as it's referenced in the article, that kind of information does exist in meeting minutes. It just requires some, some time to go through if you want to go through. 
if it's worth municipal resources doing something like this, and if council chooses to make it happen, council is absolutely welcome to make it happen. I will say though, in most municipal legislation across the provinces, the, the role of council is pretty narrowly defined. And one of the things that's typically in the definition is thou shalt show up to meetings of council and council committees. Things like showing up to community events and cutting ribbons aren't usually, if ever, in the municipal legislation uh, that, is, that is part of the provinces and territories. That's considered, if you like, voluntary or extra work. Municipal, uh, municipal officials are supposed to show up to meetings. They're supposed to create policies and bylaws, enact them, review them, rescind them, whatever the case may be, and make decisions in the best long-term interests of their communities. But in order to do that, I think the councillor's right. You actually do have to show up to make that happen. What's going on specifically with Sudbury and whether it's been solved, I can't speak to the details beyond what's in the article, but councillors should show up to meetings. We will be taking a quick break and we'll be back right after this with our interview with Nancy Simmons and Lauren Ingalls. Abuse against municipal officials, elected and staff members has risen dramatically over the past handful of years, and to date, everyone has been dealing with these issues on their own, and often on a case-by-case -case basis. While we can't eliminate all abuse of officials, we can take steps to mitigate the impact of those instances. On April 27th and April 28th, Strategic Steps Incorporated is hosting a symposium in Edmonton, Alberta, focused on bucking the trend. Attendees will come away with the understanding of fostering a safe space for both administration and council. Learn from industry leaders on how to deal with unsafe and abusive behavior, how to build a supportive team that provides support and you can walk away with the tools and resources to help avoid abuse in local government. Get your tickets today at buckingthetrend.ca. Today's guests are Nancy Simmons and Lorraine Ingalls. Nancy Simmons is the CEO of Heartland Housing Foundation, which is a not-for-profit housing management body that provides affordable and near-market housing for over 800 residents of Strathcona County and Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta. Heartland Housing Foundation currently operates 11 affordable and near market housing sites, including four senior lodges and six seniors only affordable apartment buildings. Lauren Ingalls is the CAO for Westwind Communities. Westwind Communities is a not for profit organization that provides quality housing and supportive services for seniors, as well as subsidized housing and services for individuals and families. It provides supportive living and public housing programs within the Foothills region of Alberta. The rent supplement program, though, extends outside the Foothills regions to include Bragg Creek, the counties of Vulcan, MD of Silver Willow, and the towns of Nancy and Claire's home. Ladies, welcome to the show. So uh, I want to get the very first question off the bat here, and I want to know from you, and I, I know I just gave a brief description of your organizations, but... Can you, in your own words, describe what Westwind Communities and the Heartland Housing Foundation uh, does? So let's start with Nancy. Nancy, what does the Heartland Housing Foundation do? Sure. So as a housing management body, um, our, our purpose is to provide housing solutions for the municipalities that we serve. Uh, they've been established through a ministerial order with the province. Um, most organizations have been in place since the 60s. And fundamentally was created to create the supportive living lodge program within our province, which is very unique to our province, but it has expanded over the years and over the decades to really be the affordable housing provider for the municipalities and specifically in smaller, smaller regions, we serve uh, a greater population um, that require affordable housing solutions. So over time we've expanded to not just be the provincially owned uh, assets within the province, but we've also expanded to meet greater demand um, and and meet um, housing needs for vulnerable populations. So in Fort Saskatchewan and Strathcona County, we we are diversifying the type of housing we provide so that we can provide a range within the housing spectrum uh, of that affordable housing, that 30% of income, as well as moving people slightly above that and, and moving into the near market rentals with the goal of eventually moving into affordable home ownership. 
Well, I think Nancy's really summarized it really well. We're both housing management bodies. Um, originally, we were created uh, specifically to provide housing seniors lodge accommodation uh, within specific municipal areas. And since the 1960s, we've expanded uh, not only the type of housing, but the diversity of housing uh, that we're providing in our local communities and that we're working really hard to continue to provide uh, not only affordable housing within our communities, but to provide interim steps from social housing uh, to near market housing uh, in order to uh, allow people to uh, provide provide and seek um, affordable housing options in our community. Um, probably the, the key part of um, the services that we provide are our supportive living lodges, our retirement living lodges. Um, they are our, our fundamental program that we provide, and that's housing seniors who generally have lived in the region or have ties to the region um, and allow them to remain in their local community. Um, I think we've found since the 1980s with the advent of more social housing programs that we've expanded uh, to include not only seniors in senior self-contained or independent living, but also to provide family housing, housing, uh, specialized housing, housing for individuals, and more recently, uh, a rental assistance benefit program, uh, which also allows um, any low-income population to seek uh, market rental accommodation. So it's really providing choices and options uh, while remaining in our local communities. The Both of you represent uh, or operate in regions that are, as Loren mentioned, a couple of cities, some towns, some rural areas as well. Nancy, same with you, essentially a couple of cities, some towns and villages and rural areas too. Do you see, well, a couple of questions. First of all, do you see people moving from the rural areas into the urban? Because as we work with local governments, we're seeing some of that happen for, around, for housing reasons. And the second is, do you see different type of need in, in terms of the housing that you provide in the smaller centers than you do in the larger centers as well, in terms of either the continuum of housing or the amount, uh, amount of housing that's required for people who are looking for it? Uh, maybe, Nancy, I'll go to you with that first. Sure. I, I would say just being fairly close to in proximity to Edmonton, we're probably seeing an influx of population into our communities because it's more um, livable communities. And so people are probably more attracted to moving out into our areas. But being a county, there's lots of smaller areas and people are probably moving closer into where the amenities are and wanting to be closer to their support systems. So High River and the Diamond Valley community just over the last 20 years, their population growth has been very modest. Um, they haven't grown quite very substantially in comparison to the town of Okotoks, um, which you know has grown just tremendously in the last 25 years. And you really see some challenges associated with that affordable housing or the lack of compared to the other two communities is, is one of the challenges. So we actually see a lot of people who would choose to live in Okotoks are living in the surrounding communities of High River and Black Diamond due to not only affordability, um, but lack of affordable housing stock that's available in the town of Okotoks on it. Um, we also see, uh, you know, a, a big challenge and a big barrier, just as Nancy Mann indicated, is transportation um, between those communities and even into Calgary. Um, Okotoks has a considerable commuter population, High River, definitely to a lesser degree, and same with Black Diamond, but there still are a, a lot of commuters. And the affordability of housing plays into that in terms of people's choices. Um, mm -hmm. The Diamond Valley marketplace uh, and High River are substantially uh, more affordable for for households, and so they're choosing those communities when there is a preference to remain in Okotoks. So we kind of have a, a skewed perspective of of demand uh, just based on the lack of inventory that's really available. Um, but we know this because people apply, and their first choice is Okotoks. But when we tell them that you know, the housing is available in these other communities, then they choose them as well. Uh, in terms of growth, um, we're seeing, continue to see growth in those communities. Um, I think that they're probably more in sync uh, 
Um, but the other piece that, that factors into um, each of those communities is the availability of a social support network um, in, in order to support their housing choices and allow them to remain in the community. And in some of our municipalities are much more advanced than others um, in terms of the social supports that they're able to provide um, people who are needing affordable housing. I'm going, to, I'm going to jump in again and ask, ask another question, too, because a lot of the people who watch this podcast are local government folk. And when we work with local governments, including places like Diamond Valley and Okotoks, we have found that they are almost always feeling a need to address the topic of housing, even though housing per se isn't something that falls within the local order of government. How are you seeing the, uh, the effect of the requirement for housing whether it's market or non-market and, and the stock that you provide, having a, the relationship between housing and the local governments and with, with, uh, with which you operate. Is it growing? Is it staying about the same? Or are you a somewhat arm's length, of course? So how is that having an impact on what you provide and what is expected by people who support their, their various local governments? I think within our local communities, uh, Okotoks, Diamond Valley and High River, housing is really at the forefront, uh, particularly in in Diamond Valley and in Okotoks, it's increasing in High River. Um, so much so we've seen each of those communities uh, complete an affordable housing needs assessment um, to the communities actively partnered uh, with us to get those needs assessments done. Um, housing in Okotoks right now is absolutely critical. I think it's uh, probably either number one or number two in terms of issues. And you see the municipalities really stepping forward and making affordable housing a real priority in the community, um, not, not just from doing a needs assessment, but from land donations, awareness, advocacy, being an active partner, coming up with creative programs to increase the supply of affordable housing. And of course, um, for us as housing management bodies, there's that underlying uh, contribution that they provide every year through requisition funding uh, for a supportive living program. And so I find within our communities, they're a very much an active player. They have representation on our board um, and they don't look at us as just the primary solution, whether it's market or non-market, um, that they're very conscientious of needing to uh, meet the demands for their growing communities and on a creative basis as well. Yeah, so I, I would say that I think, Chris, you're right, that housing is a topic of conversation across this country. And the reality for smaller municipalities like Loren and I is that it does become a municipal problem, even though they want to be careful that they don't they don't go into the world of affordable housing because there is a, a level of responsibility from the province and the federal government to help establish the need within our community. But the reality is, is we still want our communities to thrive and that does become the responsibility of the municipality. So we're very fortunate in being a key partner in the discussions of affordable housing within our communities. And so like Loren, we've, we've worked with our local municipalities to find ways that are less cost prohibitive for the municipality to contribute to housing and the affordability of it. So looking at ways that they can contribute land either through a, a direct transfer of land or long-term lease agreements that will help us establish the, the developments or looking at ways to be creative in property tax exemptions, whether it's through, if it's through a grant, um, if they want to protect the property tax itself, uh, and also relaxation of development fees. So where, where are the red tape costs that could help us as developers reduce our overall cost? And we want our aim and our goal is to create the lowest affordable housing developments in order to reduce the amount of rents we charge back to to our population that we serve. And I might just add to that, that um, Alberta municipalities some years ago produced a, an excellent document on um, options that municipalities could, could explore to incentivize affordable housing development. Um, you know, from secondary suites to um, providing small grant incentives, uh, to fast tracking affordable housing development in addition to the waivers. Not all of those options have to cause money, cost money um, that uh, 
those pieces, um, I think there was probably 13 to 15 options that were available have really proven successful in other jurisdictions within Canada really to incentivize housing. And I think any municipality that's genuinely interested in uh, furthering affordable housing development in their community um, would, as part of their affordable housing strategy, really look at those options and see, see what priorities um, and success stories they can have in their own community. I want to ask the final question here before we do our wrap up and it's a overarching one and it's kind of a, I didn't send it to you guys prior to the interview. So this is a unique entity here, but what does success look like to your organization? At the end of the day, what do how do you measure success in the nonprofit housing market? So let's start with Nancy on that one. So I don't think there's a way for us to ever feel like we're done. I think the job is always going to be there. What we talk about in our communities is how do we create localized solutions that help our community members stabilize housing within their community and to really help where they work, live and play. And something we talk about quite often is how can we ensure that we as a community are not putting our our burden, the housing burden on Edmonton, who then has to take care of a greater surrounding area. We want to ensure that we can continue allowing our communities to thrive. And in doing that, we stabilize housing. So we, we work at localized solutions and we work in great partnership, not just with our municipalities, but with our community partners, all of our social support groups who can help give wraparound support services over and above housing. And I would say that's one of our biggest successes, who we partner with and how well we partner with them to create localized solutions. Well, I'm going to drill down a little bit more. I'm going to say, you know, satisfy tenants and residents, um, because those are social indicators and determinants of, of health, and not only of those individuals, but of the community too. And um, you know, making sure that people can live in an environment where they have dignity and respect, um, I think, bides well for the overall arching community. Um, I'd say a broader range of housing and supports in our local communities, because housing isn't enough. Um, as we're finding uh, globally and particularly nationally, um, how important mental wellness is, not just physical wellness, but mental wellness. And so, you know, housing, of course, is a, a big indicator of stability, uh, but we also need those supports in our local community in, in order to have um, all segments of the population thrive. Uh, Well-maintained housing stock that's market relevant. Um, both Nancy and I uh, talked about the fact that uh, our organizations are over 60 years old. And uh, in our case, we have housing stock that's at the end of its life cycle. Uh, it's it's well maintained, but it might not be relevant to today's population. Uh, even things like plugins, having insufficient number of plugins, and in housing stock that's thirty five years, you know, of age, and but nowhere to plug in all your electronics, um, can really be problematic on it. And ensuring that that housing stock is safe and secure and well maintained is a challenge that I think Nancy and I face pretty routinely in trying to balance our budgets. Um, of course, timely admissions to our, our programs and services. You know, ideally we talked about uh, in our supportive living program um, that there's uh, enough turnover and there's enough product that we see that we're able to house people in under three months, waiting years for housing. Um, when you have limited resources, um, you know, that's heartbreaking. And I think Nancy and I encounter that all the time. Um, people are urgently seeking housing. So uh, success to me looks like being able to house people on a timely basis, that they're, uh, that we have some housing options and solutions for them. And of course, we wanna make sure at, for all levels of government, uh, particularly the province and our municipalities and from our own selves, from a governance perspective, that our operations are sustainable. And uh, that becomes really important because that allows us to uh, then be able to grow our organization, provide more housing supports and services in the future. 
Lorraine and Nancy, I want to extend a personal thank you from both myself and Ian for sitting down and talking about how housing and organizations like Westwind Communities and Heartland Housing Foundation play a role in helping people. For more information about Westwind Communities and the Heartland Housing Foundation, please visit the look the links in the show notes. Well, Ian, another great interview, another great episode of the Political Trenches, local government at work, wasn't it? It was. You know, I think I say every time it's just fun. And I think it's fun because I have a passion for this. You do, too. And obviously, so do the people we interview. So it is fun. So we just want to remind people that tickets for the Bucking the Trend, Tackling Abuse in the Political Realm Symposium taking place on April 27th and 28th of this year in Edmonton are still available to purchase. Visit www.buckingthetrend.ca. I'm looking forward to the event, aren't you, Ian? Of course, well, I'm obviously going to say yes, but yeah, I am. And I've been interested, too, by some of the questions and uh, responses we've been getting from outside Alberta as well. It really indicates that this is an issue that's not specific to one particular jurisdiction. We're getting a lot of traction, uh, interestingly, from Eastern Canada. So that's kind of interesting. Thank you for joining us on the Political Trenches Local Government at Work, hosted by Ian McCormack and Chris Brown, myself. Don't forget to subscribe to your YouTube channel and podcast on your preferred platform so you stay up to date with new episodes as they are released. The full interview with Nancy Simmons and Lauren Ingalls will be available on all podcast platforms next Wednesday. We'll be returning in two weeks, so be sure to tune in. See you then.